Hello everyone. So today we'll be discussing few MCQs which came in uh, NEET SS 2025. But before starting, I want to just give a disclaimer that all these questions are based on the students recall who attempted the exam. The questions may not be exact, but topics and concepts remain relevant. Some options are reconstructed. These are basically for the revision and practice and not an official key or paper. So coming to first question. So the most common lobe of the lung involved in bronchitis. An answer for it is left lower lobe. So here you can see 29.09% denoting left lower lobe, which is the most common. Then coming to second question. So a patient presenting with hepatic encephalopathy, recurrent right side pleural effusion, USG abdomen, showing cirrhotic liver and no ascites. So what is the next appropriate treatment? TIPS, which stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, IPC, indwelling pleural catheter and pleurodesis, referral for liver transplantation, chest tube and pleurodesis. So the gold standard again is referral for liver transplantation, but that then that needs time. So the next appropriate treatment in this question is TIPS. So this is a screenshot from uh, Light's book which says that the management of hepatic hydrothorax is a difficult problem and the best treatment for this problem is insertion of TIPS, which is transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or maybe liver transplantation. But till the time patient is being planned for liver transplantation, the TIPS can act as a bridging therapy. But there is no indication of doing pleurodesis, IPCs, ICD insertion in such patient. So recurrent right side pleural effusion in cirrhosis patient basically occur due to trans diaphragmatic flow of ascitic fluid. And this can occur even in the absence of visible ascites also. So TIPS basically reduces the portal hypertension and control these effusion. Pleurodes is not effective because there will be continuous leakage of fluid and that will prevent addition formation. Liver transplantation, again, as I told, it is definitive but requires listing and evaluation. Chest tube is actually contraindicated due to the risk of massive fluid loss, protein depletion and infection. Coming to third question, what structure is found in all four compartments of mediastinum? And that is a very easy one. So everyone can answer that is lymph node. This is a diagram from Fishman. So you can see. Question number four, which IV biologic, actually which biologic is given intravenously in asthma? So there is only one IV biologic for asthma and that is Resilizumab. So this is a table showing Omali, Mepoli, Binbrali, Resli, Dupilumab and Tezepelumab. And here are the mode of administration where every monoclonal antibody is given subcutaneously except Resli which is given intravenously. Then next question, what percentage of uh, patients with LTBI latent TB infection will have a reactivation of TB disease? So this is some tricky question because in most of the guidelines, the value is written as 5 to 10 percent. Somewhere it is written as 10 percent also. So I'll go with 10 percent. This is from the TPT guidelines all, only. So it says 5 to 10 percent of those infected will develop active TB disease over the course of their lives. Then triad of 4 is a characteristic histopathology of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, IPF, DIP or NSIP. So this question must be given by someone who is reading Murray and Nadal. So this screenshot is from Murray and Nadal. And here we can see in the histopathology part that the hallmark of histopathology in HP is referred as triad of four, including a diffuse lymphoplasmacytic interstitial infiltrate with bronchiolus intricate cancuation, poorly formed granulomas, and a foci of organizing pneumonia. So the answer for triad of four is HP. Coming to the next, like this. Coming to the next question, 30-year-old female with a history of dyspnea for last two years diagnosed as IPAH, idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension after a thorough evaluation. So what is the best drug to be used for the treatment? They have not commented upon vasoreactivity testing as such. 
and the option given were bosantan, nifedipine, diltiazem, epoprostanol. So the answer will be bosantan, of course. So here you can see that bosantan is a dual endothelin receptor A and B antagonist. And in some trials of patients with IPH and PH associated with connective tissue disease, bosantan actually improves six minute walk distance by 44 meters compared to placebo at 16 minutes. Again, some other trials, the survival of IPH patient treated with bosentin was 96% at one year and 89% at two year compared with the expected survival of 69% and 57% respectively. So, bosentin is the answer for this question. Coming to the next question, which trial is not associated with IPF, ascent, capacity, impulse, and iphigenia? So the confusing word is impulse and impulses. So the answer is impulse, of course, because it's the impulses trial where nintadenib showed uh, improvement in IPF. So, so this is a uh, ascent trial that is and on in IPF. This is capacity trial, uh, capacity one and two. So this is also and on in IPF. Then uh, Iphigenia trial, that is high dose of acetylcysteine in IPF again. And the impulses, that is an interim in IPF. Here, uh, I could get this data only that impulse is basically, uh, they are studying a drug in small cell lung cancer which is Lefito Limor. Coming to the next question, dupilumab is primarily indicated for which subset of COPD patients according to the gold guidelines. So these all were the option. And answer will be patient with type 2 inflammation and elevated eosinophil counts of more than 300. So if we come to the gold guidelines, we could see here dupilumab. It is indicated in chronic bronchitis, not an emphysema patient. And eosinophil level should be more than equal to 300. For further information on this dupilumab topic in COPD, you can go to my other video on my channel. The link is given below. Then which mutation is seen in BHD or bird hog dupe syndrome? So, of course, it is FLCN gene, which is polyethylene gene, tumor suppressor gene it is. The other three option, BMPR2, it is seen in heritable pulmonary hypertension, then delta F508, everyone knows it's cystic fibrosis, and TSC2 is tuberous sclerosis. Which monoclonal antibody targets IL4 receptor alpha? So these all options were given, and the answer is again dupilumab. So there were many questions on dupilumab this time. So, tralithunumab is IL-13 antagonist, mecolizumab is IL-5 antagonist, dupilumab is IL-4 receptor alpha antagonist, tezepelumab is anti-TSLP monoclonal antibody. TSLP stands for thymic stromal lymphopoietin. Coming to the next question, the drug which is effective if, uh, in EML-4 ALK mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And answer is trizotinib. Other drugs are like loratinib, brigatinib. Then coming to next question, which of the following is contraindication for TB profile excess? Pregnancy, CKD, prior history of TB, chronic hepatitis. So coming again to these guidelines for programmatic management of TB preventive therapy given in 2021. So it clearly says that pregnancy and previous history of TB, these are not contraindication of TPT. CKD is also not a contraindication for TPT. So the only answer is acute and chronic hepatitis. Coming to the next question, which of the following is seen in yellow nail syndrome? So the options were clubbing, depth under nail, oncolysis, and pleural effusion. So obviously the answer is pleural effusion, which is seen as chylothorax in yellow nail syndrome. The other three options are very non-specific. Uh, clubbing is very rarely seen. On eicolysis can be seen, but if we have pleural effusion, that is like uh, it can be seen in more number of patients in yellow nail syndrome. So the answer is pleural effusion. Coming to the next question, steroids in severe COPD is indicated at what eosinophil count level? 
So these were the option that is between 100 to 200, more than 300, less than 100, and between 200 to 300. So coming to the latest goal guidelines, so they clearly says that steroid are to be given if the blood regional field count is more than equal to 300. For further update in goal 2025, you can go to this link. So coming to the next question, a 30-year-old female uh, who had a normal vaginal delivery two days ago and she is seeking for fitness to fly and she is asymptomatic, no history of DVT, hypertension or any ops complication. So what is the best advice you can give her for uh, air travel? So I think no air travel for a week at least will be the best advice for her. Coming to the next question. A 38-year-old female non-smoker, she presented with persistent cough, low-grade fatigue, occasional fever over the past two months. She had no palpable lymphadenopathy or any skin lesion. Her lab showed hypercalcemia, leukopenia, and raise in ESR. Chest imaging reveals micronodular infiltrates with few mediastinal lymphadenopathy, no cavitation as such, no pleural effusion. She underwent TBLV and patient histopathology of this TBLV showed well-formed soft granulomas with epithelioid histiocytes and multinucleated giants. So the whole history basically confuses you between TB and sarcoidosis. And based on this soft granulomas, which are more commonly seen in sarcoidosis, the answer for this will be sarcoidosis. For further into soft and hard granulomas, you can go to the link given. Next question, what, uh, which condition will have the least failure rate of NIV? So everyone knows the answer and that is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. These are the latest guidelines of ERS uh, for NIV in the acute respiratory failure. You can read these guidelines. Coming to the next question, a 72-year-old female with COPD with a resting PaO2 on ABG showing 48 mmHg while breathing ambient air started on LTOT. Which statement fits best with LTOT when you are evaluating this patient after one year as per the Redox trial? So this is a very new trial, Redox trial. These four were the options. So basically, they are asking you any advantage of giving 24-hour LTOT over 15-hour LTOT. So this was published in NEGM uh, in September 2024. So basically, the conclusion was that in patients with severe hypoxemia, LTOT used for 24 hours per day did not result in lower risk of hospitalization or death within one year then therapy for 15 hours per day. So basically, there was no significant difference. So C was the answer. Coming to the next question, NAVA, that is Neural Assisted Ventilation Mode. And which statement is correct regarding this mode? So these were the options. It requires an esophageal catheter, of course. And EDI is calculated through this. And they, there are multiple electrodes which records the electrical activity of the diaphragm. Then at a given NAVA level, the sum of the patient and the ventilator pressure will be equal to transpulmonary pressure. Yeah, of course. And the third option, it decreases patient ventilator dyssynchrony, but increases the risk of incidence of ventilator-induced lung injury, which is false. So the answer for this question is both A and B. So there is a to, uh, Tobin's book of principle and practice of mechanical ventilation, you can read this. But uh, summarizing NAVA, so it's basically brain to breath synchrony. So NAVA uses the electrical activity of the diaphragm to trigger and modulate the ventilatory support. There is a catheter, nasogastric catheter with few electrodes at various levels which detects diaphragmatic signals. And then ventilator uses these signals time to time and portion the breath. So this is all proportional assisted. Better synchronization, less chances of villi. Weaning is very friendly. Coming to the next question, NC fentanyl, that is a new drug again added to the latest goal 2025. There was a question on this also. So all of the following statements are true, except so they provide bronchodilation by inhibiting PDE3. It is given orally 
twice daily along with other maintenance treatment of COPD reduces inflammation by inhibiting PDE4, act as leukotriene receptor antagonist to reduce inflammation and promote ciliary mortality. So all the three options which are telling the mechanism of action are absolutely true. A, C, and D, all three are absolutely true. The false statement is B because it is not available in oral form. It comes in nebulization form at present at a doses of 3 and 6 mg. This is a slide I prepared and uh, you can further go for NC Fentron reading uh, by clicking on this link. Coming to the next question. So lung donor. Which of the following lung donor characteristic is acceptable for transplantation with no significant increase in recipient mortality? So the answer for this is hepatitis C virus infection history in the past. So if you go to the latest guidelines, lung transplantation guidelines and the current contraindication, it says active hepatitis C with biopsy proven histological evidence of liver disease is actually the contraindication, not a prior history of hepatitis C. Coming to the next question, a 70-year-old male recovering from hypoxemic respiratory failure. Patient is on HFNC, flow rate 40, FiO2 40%, oxygen saturation is 94%, respiratory rate is okay and no signs of respiratory distress. So what is the next appropriate step in managing this patient? So basically, they are trying to ask you, how do you wean from HFNC? Do you decrease FI2 first or you decrease flow first? So these were the options given. And the answer for this is that you reduce the flow rate by 10 liter per minute and then monitor the patient's response. So this is the guidelines for HFNC given in 2022, present in ERS clinical practice guidelines. You can go through it. Coming to the next question, a 38-week pregnant woman diagnosed with pulmonary embolism and she is scheduled for induction of labor. So what is the most appropriate anticoagulant you can use in this scenario? LMWH, warfarin, UFH or rivaroxaban. So everyone knows the answer. This was an easy one. So UFH is preferred close to the term pregnancy, especially during labor induction because it has a shorter half-life if given by IV root 1 to 2 hours, if given subcutaneously 3 to 4 hours, and then it is reversible also. Compared to the other LMWH, it has slightly a longer half-life of around 4 to 6 hours and it can still pose higher bleeding risk during delivery. The other drugs like warfarin and noax, these are contraindicated in pregnancy because of teratogenicity, fetal risk, and lack of talk. 